Now, I hope that you're starting to feel the joy of Christmas, but I think I'd acknowledge that for many of you, you're not there yet. Christmas is often quite a complicated time. There's a lot to be done. It can be stressful. Families can bring complications. And often we can kind of get quite bogged down in all of that. And it's, um, it's not easy to kind of grasp the joy that there is at the heart of all of this. Now, all of that stuff that needs to be done is important, of course, but it's not what this is all about. And if we want to really feel the joy of this, I think we need to pause and look beyond the tinsel and the gifts and the busyness to allow the wonder of this to sink in. And we are going to allow a wonderful person to lead us into that joy. And that person is Mary. Now, this passage follows on from the Annunciation where the angel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to have a child and not just any child. Um, And despite her concern about the obvious obstacle that she was a virgin... Mary received that news with joy. And um, her response is is a, a beautiful response. Her response was this. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Do you hear that what Mary does is says yes to God? That, um, that she chooses to be part of of this story. And I just think before we get into the substance of this, that in itself is a really very important thing. That there is a choice that is to be made for each of us, actually. The way that God works is not to force these things upon us, but he allows us to choose to be part of them. And if we're going to enter into the joy of Christmas, there is a yes that is required from us, a choice to be part of it. Each of us is asked to echo Mary's words, to say something like, I am the Lord's servant. May your words to me be fulfilled. Her yes is a lovely, faith-filled response to who God is, And what he is doing. And we likewise need to make that choice. To say yes to God. Now if you're not quite ready to do that yet. Then let's allow this story to unfold. And we'll come back to that at the end. Because there's a beautiful invitation here. So you might remember from the Annunciation story. That uh, the angel mentioned that. Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, who was getting on in years, was also pregnant. And uh, that that was amazing news. And so what Mary does, as soon as she's found out what's happening to her, is she runs off to see this cousin. They're clearly quite close to one another, despite the age difference. And uh, so she runs off, goes travels south past Bethlehem into the hill country of Judea. And there she gets to Zechariah's house, and she meets Elizabeth. And uh, there is this lovely scene. Did you hear it in the text? As these two women, both overwhelmed with joy at what's happening to them, of what they've been caught up in, uh, meet one another and embrace and almost dance together with the joy of it all. And, um, but there's a really interesting moment because, um, don't forget, this is quite a traditional culture. And uh, Elizabeth is clearly quite a lot older. Mary's quite young. And in a traditional culture, uh, the older woman would expect a very sort of deferential response from the younger woman, to be treated very respectfully. But in actual fact, the reverse of that happens. Look at verse 43. Elizabeth, the older woman, says, Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Do you hear that? 
really interesting. The older treats the younger with incredible respect. And of course, she's right to do so. Elizabeth gets it. Mary is enormously significant because of the role that she's playing in this story. She is mother to the Christ child. Mother to the one who is to be king. And as such, is to be treated with great esteem. I think Mary is a a wonderful figure. I think she is an amazing, um, intelligent, uh, inspirational, theologically literate, radically faithful young woman. I think she's one of the most wonderful figures in the New Testament. And there's a real shame, you know, that in a lot of that kind of um, Reformation argument, Protestant and and Catholic, that um, many of us... Um, in a reaction against the sort of overblown theology around Mary, have ended up almost entirely ignoring her. And that's a tragedy, because she is a figure to be celebrated. She is absolutely wonderful. She's hugely important. And I think we need to kind of, I don't know, reclaim Mary as one of the great heroes of the New Testament, because she is absolutely that. Elizabeth treats her with great dignity and respect, and she is right to do so. We should do the same. And if you want evidence of that, it's there in the song of Mary, which is in this passage. It's a lovely thing. It's rich and beautiful. It's commonly called the Magnificat. You might know it. It's been sung in cathedrals and monasteries for nearly two millennia. It's a... a, an incredible piece of writing. Uh, The name Magnificat comes from the first word of it in Latin. Uh, So in in Latin it begins Magnificat Animea Mea, my soul magnifies. And um, it's um, it's a song that Mary sings, and it's, um, it's inspired by the Psalms that she would have grown up with, It specifically echoes um, uh, 1 Samuel 2, Hannah, who was Samuel's mother, who sings something here, and this is inspired by that. But it is a delight. It's rich and full of joy, and it has this profound vision of what the Christ child has come to accomplish. And I think if we will allow it, it will lead us into the joy of Christmas. And it begins with gratitude. And I would like to suggest that a life marked by joy will always be founded on gratitude. She says, verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We often get bogged down in the frustrations of life and the disappointments and the hurts and the grievances, all of which may well be valid and unnatural, but the accumulation of them often leaves us cold and even bitter. And if we are going to live lives marked by joy, then we need to choose gratitude. We need to do that each day, to remember what God has done for us, and to be grateful for it, to count our blessings, to give thanks to God from whom all blessings flow. And remember, remember, we're such forgetful people. You know, in the midst of everything, we forget the good things that happened yesterday, never mind 20 years ago, and yet those blessings are real and have shaped us. We need to actually do the job of remembering the good things that have happened so that they might mark our every day. In fact, one of the things I'm going to suggest to you this evening is that there would be a lot to be said for writing your own Magnificat like Mary has done. To write your own story of God's faithfulness to you and your place in his purposes and perhaps come back to that day by day. A life marked with joy will be founded upon gratitude. 
And that joy comes from remembering what God has done for you. Verse 48. God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. This young peasant girl from a poor background in a fairly patriarchal and oppressive culture has been elevated to a place of dignity and honor. She is celebrated and her voice is heard. God has done amazing things for her. Her life has been given meaning and dignity. And God has done the same for you. God has given you meaning and dignity in your life. You have a a place amongst his people. You are loved and honored. God has done wonderful things for you too. And of course, the the gospel, Christianity has consistently done that for ordinary people around the world throughout history. I think the main reason it spread like wildfire through the ancient world was because it did just that. That the kind of the underclasses of the Roman Empire suddenly discovered in the message of Jesus that their lives mattered. That they could be caught up in the purposes of God. That they could be granted a dignity which their world would never grant them. God has done wonderful things for all of us. And let's be clear, that dignity does not come from anywhere else. It is a profoundly Christian idea to say that all lives matter, that even the least of people are made in the image of God and have dignity and are loved and welcomed and reconciled by God. God opposes the proud and raises up the humble. He redeems our life from the pit and welcomes us into his family. God has done wonderful things for each of us. Secondly, joy comes from remembering what God has done in history. Um, It's lovely to remember our own experience of blessing and the good things that God has done for us. But we have this actual amazing um, experience of having seen God keep his promises. Um, So if you remember, the events of Christmas are a fulfillment of a promise of God. But that that promise had been made hundreds of years earlier. And that this um, hope and expectation of God's people that a a true and good king would, would come, well, that was fulfilled. It just took centuries. You imagine being those people who are hoping and praying for God to fulfill his promises. Well, we have seen that happen. And so um, verse 50 says, his mercy is upon those who fear him from generation to generation. I suppose this idea that the purposes of God are uh, long They play out over a long period of time. And he has not forgotten us. He is faithful to his uh, promises. It's just that those promises are worked out over long periods of time. And we have this privilege that we have seen God act in history. We have seen his intervention in who Jesus is. We've seen the cross and the resurrection. And so we need to kind of remember the ways that God has been faithful and then hold on to that to trust him for the future. In fact, someone once said that faith is the art of holding on to what we believe to be true in spite of our changing circumstances and moods. If we're governed by circumstances or how we're feeling, we'll be blown backwards and forwards. And the act of faith is to hold on to what we believe to be true and allow that to be the thing which guides us. So joy comes from remembering what God has done in history and trusting that he will continue to act in that way into the future. Did you hear that lovely line? It said, uh, God has brought down rulers from their thrones and lifted up the humble. And of course, that's how God has always worked. Throughout the Old Testament, God is always kind of raising up the least of people and and opposing the proud. 
And so that was true of Jacob. It was true of King David. It was true of the nation of Israel. God has always done that thing. And um, there's a, I mean, amazing sense in which, you know, in the centuries that followed immediately after the birth of Jesus, well, exactly that happened. That the, the gospel turned the world upside down. That um, uh, empires fell, that, that um, the poor were raised up. God did amazing things and continues to do that. And so joy comes from being part of God's purposes. That um, the thing that Mary says to us is that there is this amazing invitation, this amazing privilege of being invited to participate in what God is doing in the world. She says his kingdom is coming and his will is being done in, on earth as it is in heaven. The world is being turned upside down or perhaps even put right. And all of that begins at Christmas. But it requires of us an answer to that invitation. A willingness to say yes to God, to be inspired by a character as wonderful as Mary who says yes to the invitation and to do that same thing, to be part of this Christmas story which is just the beginning of all that God is doing in the world. And so this is the Magnificat and um, we're invited to join in with Mary's song and let it seep into our souls and shape our dreams of what God is doing in this world and uh, to find our place in this coming kingdom. A life marked by joy will be founded on gratitude. What are you grateful to God for? How are you going to remember that and delight in that day by day? Perhaps you could write your own Magnificat and say, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Amen.